But most importantly, it's resiliency and it's movement and it's energy. And if I can get those things in place to where every day they're waking up and they feel like a machine and they're recovering and we're doing this through proper nutrition and, you know, maybe some healthy supplementation and rest and recovery modalities and all this stuff, you know, my job is to get them through however many weeks or months they, they have to be shooting and turn around and not feel like they got hit by a car. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, we're speaking with a celebrity trainer and entrepreneur who is known for his incredible physique and transforming some of the biggest names in Hollywood into superheroes. He's the owner of the New York Gym Drive 495, and over the course of his 20 plus year career, he has trained more than 40,000 one hour sessions. When A-list celebrities need to transform their bodies for the big screen, this is the guy they call in. His star-studded clientele includes Ryan Reynolds, Scarlett Johansson, and Hugh Jackman. In our interview, we dive into what is resiliency and why is that his number one goal when training high-profile clients, invaluable lessons he's learned from enduring business hardships, and why is nutrition the most important but misunderstood area of fitness. So please welcome Mr. Don Saladino to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Mr. Don Saladino, uh, welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. We've been trying to get you for some time and I've, uh, I've, I have been an avid follower of your content on YouTube and you do some, uh, you certainly educated me about working out and nutrition and supplements. So I'm uh, really pleased to be able to uh, ask you a bunch of questions about what you do. Love it. Thank you. So I just want to start off. I, I, um, you know, I've, I've, I was reading a lot of the stuff online, and, and you're you're kind of known, or certainly your online presence is very strong in terms of your your sort of training people to be superheroes. And um, I wonder who is your favorite superhero? I don't have a favorite superhero. <laughs> I mean, I um, you know I definitely enjoy all the movies, and you know I've been working with a handful of them for a long time. I mean. You know, um, I mean, Ryan Reynolds, you know, is like, I, I consider him a brother to me. Uh, Sebastian Stan, I consider him a brother to me. Um, there are people I've gotten incredibly close with, but, you know, all the other superheroes that I worked with, like I'm very grateful to Hugh Jackman because he got me started. So yeah, you know, I'm very grateful for all of them I worked with. I mean, as for my favorite, it, it always becomes fun to watch them in these roles because in a way, uh, you're you're able to remove yourself from actually knowing them and that's when i know you know they're they're doing a great job with their acting as i'm sitting there and i'm watching them and i forget it's someone i'm so close to so um it's just been a lot of fun to be able to uh kind of hold on to their coattails for this ride and it's something now i think coaching i've been doing for you know 23 24 years professionally and i think working with the superheroes was probably closer to 15 years now so uh I am a seasoned veteran in the business and uh, still having a lot of fun with it. So what's the mental attitude and discipline discipline like from some of these sort of superheroes or I guess Hollywood actors? Is it, do, do you find it sort of different than when you're training a, a high level CEO or, or, you know, a regular client that comes off the street? Is there something that I suppose that makes them the top of their game in their acting world is that, that they bring into when you're when you're training with them at all you know it is it is much different now the human body isn't much different because whether it's a ceo or whether it's ryan you know we're all made up of the same thing cells tissue skin muscle all this all the stuff you know that the man upstairs created us with but um i i do know that i i believe that most people out there are always under this assumption that you know, training, you know, a celebrity is, is much easier because they have their private chef, chef and, you know, they control their own schedule. It couldn't be any more further from the truth. It's, um, uh, you know, I honestly believe that training a celebrity in my experience, training a celebrity and training like a celebrity athlete, training the actual Hollywood person's way more, it's way diff way more difficult and there's way more variables. Um, you know, when you're looking at a professional athlete, you typically know, you know their schedule and you know what time zone they're going to be in and you know um you know a lot of those variables granted injury happens and they might roll an ankle or something happens but that happens to the hollywood star like a lot of these hollywood stars now are doing a lot of their own stunts and they are you know i can't tell you how many times ryan has broken bones or something has happened because he's jumping through a window or do it or doing something like like that so i think when you you know 
put this all into a pot and you say, all right, well, they're doing a lot of their own stunts and a lot of their own, you know, uh, 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 you know, doing a lot of their own, yeah, doing a lot of their own stunts and they, um, they don't have necessarily have a chef and they have to, you know, travel to different time zones and they're away from their family. And, oh, guess what? Uh, this camera just broke down on set and they had to stay an additional three hours and they were there past midnight and they had to be up by five in the morning. It becomes very, very challenging. There are so many moving parts on these movie sets that most people aren't aware of. And if one thing goes down, it can literally halt the entire set. You know, for instance, someone loses someone in their family. One of the big actors in one of these movies loses someone in their family, which I'm bringing up because has happened. And, um, you know, what happens to that set now? You know, they have to shut down the set now. Now everything gets delayed and, and people are stranded and they may not be able to go home because of COVID or specific things are happening. So it is it is way trickier and way more challenging than most people uh, lead on to um, really under, understand. Mm. It, it's clear that you've been able to get a lot of people to grow and develop and become something that they probably weren't before they met you. Have you got any client, celebrity, athlete that's that's caused you to grow more than anyone else? And if so, what you know, what, what what's that story about? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. I think when I look at someone like Ryan, I mean, I think Ryan's really pushed me a lot uh, because I, I just I look at him as some as someone that I'm very close to, but also you know, he's done so much in the business world. And I, and I really, I, I love business. It's part of, I think what makes me different than most, co most coaches is that I am, I'm a fitness entrepreneur. I have, I, I own several businesses and I have launched several businesses and I've had to do cap raises and I've had businesses that have been successful and have crashed hard. Um, so I think watching Ryan, you know, what he goes through and his approach to things and almost his approach to excellence and how he, handles a lot of the marketing and how he handles the press and, you know, watching that level of professionalism that he could just turn on, you know, even if he's having a bad day, I think to me is just shows this high level of excellence that I really admire. Yeah. I, I read an article online about you and you were talking about <clears throat> uh, over time that you've had to get used to not being quite as emotional from a business perspective as, as what you had. It's certainly something that I, resonate with as well particularly in a in an industry and in a business that you're very passionate about that mm -hmm. you you know I've, I've got carried away with the emotional side and probably not looked as much as about the logical side so t tell us a bit about your experience in that and how you know what what are some of the things that you do when you are going into different opportunities to ensure that you get that balance right between yeah i think this is a great idea i've, I've got that gut feel but also logically it's going to make sense yeah um First off, there were a lot of decisions that I made in the past that were emotional and they weren't business decisions early on. You know, you're opening, I'm opening this club where I went in and I raised a significant amount of money. You know, I'm 26, 27 years old, you know, I'm raising 5 million bucks. And, you know, I think specific things back then were ego driven. It was like, oh, trying to make the best facility and the best equipment and, you know, overdoing things with the shake bar and, and, you know, all, all these things that were just, you know, they were really nice, but from a business standpoint, didn't make sense. And it's funny because when I opened the club 15, more than, more than that, 16 years ago, it became such a part of my identity. I actually used to think about what's going to happen when I don't have it anymore. And there was this fear that always ran through my head because I really felt like that it was so, I was so emotionally attached to it. And don't get it wrong. I mean, this is something that put me on the map, you know, drive 495 and then drive 443. And it allowed me to connect with some incredible people and allowed um, myself to get on a specific pedestal that I probably wouldn't have had if I didn't have the club. But um, I was fortunate enough to be able to exit from that facility, those facilities, uh, doing it my way and, and, and exiting in a way where I almost felt like I was stepping into something better. Um, not that I would ever, um, disregard the fact of, of how important that was to me or, or what a learning curve that was for me, but it was time to move on. And, and, and I really did it in a way where I was actually excited. There wasn't an ounce of like, I'm going to miss this place. I remember walking in there on the last day when it, everything was out of there and just looking at it and kind of smiled and just looking at, you know, looking at the facility, it sounds corny, but just being like, thanks, because those 15 years they were hell. <laughs> it was, it was, it was unbelievable. And I think someone like your buddy, Jay Wright would, would, would allude to it. Also those 15 years, I mean, there were several 
months or years where I could turn around and say, wow, we were cruising along. There was always something going wrong with Manhattan real estate. There was, you know, if, if the air conditioning wasn't exploding, um, the staff member was leaving. And if the staff left, member wasn't leaving, there was a blackout. And if there wasn't a blackout, there was Hurricane Sandy. And it was just on it. And then out of nowhere, Con Ed or Verizon has a shutdown and then you're down power or, you know, just things. It was, it just seemed like every week there was some piece of crap being thrown at you. And it really taught me patience and it taught me to relax and say to myself, man, it's going to be okay. Cause there was, I, I want to say there was a period of time where I almost missed 37 payrolls, 37 payrolls. Like that's significant. Like my rent every year was $750,000. My overhead to break even was $2 million in one club. Like I was a risk taker. Like I, I jumped into this stuff, not knowing how to swim and I had to learn how to swim pretty quickly. And you know, what? I did it for a long period of time and I lived out the life of the lease. I couldn't have been any more proud. But if you told me 15 years ago that my lease was going to expire um, May 31st of 2020 and Cuomo was going to shut down gyms in the city on March 16th at 8 p.m. I mean, at that point, I just, you know, I, I turned to my wife and we came up with an incredible idea and it just it, it literally erupted almost overnight. And um, then you were immediately transitioning into this new business model that suddenly you're looking at something that was so important to you saying, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I don't want to have to deal with the landlord. I don't want to have to deal with this guy who's, you know, I just paid three months for the life of the lease and he's trying to file a lawsuit on me for stuff that I'm not even responsible for. Like, why do I want to be in bed with someone like this? So these are some really, I mean, these 15 years, I will never, I would never turn around and say, take that away from me. I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. I wouldn't be as successful as I am. I wouldn't have the context that I have. And I wouldn't be going on the trajectory that I'm going on right now. But let, let me tell you, like I, there was many nights, many nights that I was going to bed, just going, holy shit. I don't know if I'm going to have a business in the morning. And, um, and that's a scary feeling. Do you, do you think now going through that experience or almost really facing your fear and going through it, it was, because uh, you know, I've, I've been there, we've been in business for 20 years and had many of those moments. And, and you know, sometimes the, the fear of what it's going to be like is, is not as much as actually when you go through it. It's like, yeah, look, <laughs> this, is, this is not as bad as I imagined. And, and yes, we've got, we've got ways to go through it. I'm, I'm just wondering, was that your experience? Because there's probably a lot of people that are in a very similar position at the moment. And, you know, they're like, you know, damn, am I going to be able to hold on? So I'm just curious to see, you know, what, what that moment was like when you knew, look, there's, there's no way you're going to keep this going. And you're, ident you're, as you said before, your identity was attached to it. And, you know, how, what was that like? Yeah, well, I mean, what's funny about it is that I did keep it going, right? Like I, I um, every, every moment that I turned around and I was like, oh, this isn't like, how are we going to, like, we need $100,000 in the next, you know, 24 hours. Where am I going to come up with that money? Or we're, we're burning up, you know, on average, a hundred grand a month for twelve straight months. Like we're literally bleeding, and most people would have like had to have jumped ship. And, and there was those emotional decisions that might have been a little bit dumb that forced us to hang on. But you know, the best advice someone you know ever gave me was like they were like, "Listen, man, they were like as bad as you think this is. The people going through a hell of a lot worse, and you know that." And whatever happens, you're going to be all right. Like you're going to figure it out. Like you might go from, go through hell. You might lose your home. <laughs> Something might happen, but you're going to bounce back on your feet. And I think just going to bed at night and I'm a pretty religious person where I just said to myself, just trusting in the process, trusting in the man upstairs, just telling myself, listen, I can't predict the future. I can only do the best that I can. And I know taking that attitude really, um, it taught me a lot because when I was younger, you get a bit apprehensive, right? Like something bad starts happening and you're like, your heart's racing. And you're like, you start panicking. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And you literally develop, you literally learn how to be a man and you literally learn how to handle those situations and take a deep breath and say, all right, this isn't good, but what can we do? What are our options? And then you start making business decisions. You start sitting down and you start really assessing things. And then maybe you got to make a few phone calls to people who may have had, you know, experience in that area. And then you start thinking about a way out. And that's what I learned to do, um, you know, underneath those circumstances. And again, um, every single successful person I've ever talked to, 
I've trained guys, you know, uh, like the ex, you know, Mike Bloomberg, or I've trained, you know, um, you know, Calvin Klein or, you know, the founders of major public companies and, you know, who are worth a lot of money. And everyone I've ever talked to said that they had to go through a really shitty period. And just mm -hmm. hearing, you know, some of these fashion designers that I know who have built up multi-billion dollar companies turn to me and say, yeah, I was living underneath my desk for two years. <laughs> and you start hearing stories like this and no, it, it makes you feel better. It really does. Cause then it says, oh my God, like, were you scared? It wasn't going to go on there like every single day. Like, I didn't know what, like I wasn't seeing my kids. I was, I was, you know, and you hear these stories um, and you say to yourself, you know, oh my God, what am I going to do? Great, great, uh, great story. One of my buddies, his name's Mark Menya. And I don't know if you've heard of him. He's um, he's one of the owners of, of uh, the anatomy gyms down in Miami. We just spoke at our buddy Luca Hosever's um, event in Seattle. And Mark got up on stage and started talking about when he um, was at the point with one of his clubs and he sat with his investor in the car. It was like on a, a weekday night and he's begging his investor to, to just let him keep the keys and let him keep the doors open. And the investor was like, oh. It was just all aggravated and you know thank god he did but mark and i were talking about those moments where you were just like you felt like your whole world was unraveling in front of you and it's it's comforting to hear other stories because you know what you have to do you either have to honestly you either have to make a business decision and say all right this is stupid fold them up or you got to put your head down and you got to run and you got to work harder than you've ever worked in your life. And you've got to turn around and figure out ways to enhance the team and make business decisions. And you have to cut costs and you have to do all these things that are, you know, difficult things to do, you know, firing people that were good friends of yours because you couldn't, you know, support them anymore and going through all that stuff. That's a part of what I do that I think most people on digital now, most people on social media, they don't, they don't see and they don't understand. They might see me put up a picture of me on the cover of Muscle and Fitness this month. Great. Fantastic. A lot of influencers out there, they're putting up programs of them, you know, looking great in their abs and, and looking all strong. Fantastic. You know, I, I, I think as a coach, as, as, a, as a business owner, you got to go through a little bit of point of that hell. I think it's important. And if you can go through a whole life without going through it and you find success, then more power to you. I still think there's something you learn out of having to kind of pull yourself out of that quicksand. That is such a valuable lesson that you'll carry for the rest of your life. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. How do, do you, or how much, when you started it, because you, you see, when you read your profile and you see the success that you've had and the client roster, you think, well, you know, this, this guy's sort of shot straight to the, the top. But how much of the, like you mentioned there, how much of the unseen hustle did you have to do to get investors, get clients? How, how much work would you have to say, in, in, and even maybe even today is, is part of that that isn't on Instagram? And, um, and that probably goes on behind the scenes. More than most coaches would ever want to be able to tolerate. I mean, I, I figured the other day I've trained probably over 40,000 one hour sessions in my life. That's a lot of sessions. And I can't tell you, I was, I mean, I remember um, signing up a member who was, um, he worked, I can't give his name, but he, but he worked for Lehman Brothers and he ran a big division over there. And he looked at me and he's like, I'll sign up right now and I'll, I'll do this package, but you know, no one's going to be able to train me the time I want to train at. I'm like, well, what time do you want to train at? And he's like, I got to be in here at like 3.45. I said, no problem. So I'm getting up now at 3 a.m. to get to the gym at 3.45. And that was something I did for years. You know, people don't hear those stories. They think it's like, oh, and, and I get a kick out of it. Like, I love, I, at first I used to get angry. I almost like, I, I think it's comical. Like, I, I'll, I'll hear these successful gurus 
who are now like, oh, I like to wake up every morning and drink mint tea and read the newspaper. And I'm like, <laughs> what planet do you come from, man? Like, are you serious? Like, I'm like, I'm not doing this in Omaha right now. I'm been no and no and no insult. I'm doing this in New York City. It's the biggest city in the world. Like, I'm walking into subways and there are bomb threats going on. Like, it is, you are not sleeping in that city. And I had to do that for 23, 24 years. And, um, you know, there are so many things behind the scenes that people did not understand or see. Like, my, my air conditioner one summer blew. It was like, I think it was over 20 grand just to fix the AC. And then I have a golf pro complaining to me that we, we didn't have them in new golf shirts. And I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to keep the AC on, man. Like, <laughs> once you start sitting in my chair and realizing the decisions that you have to make, it's really easy for people to criticize until they're sitting in your seat. And um, I've really learned over time not to be so bitter about that stuff. I, I honestly, truthfully, just kind of laugh it off and just say, you know what, they didn't understand. But there were so many things behind closed doors. There wasn't, I, I, for me to say there wasn't a day that goes by, that would be stretching it. I, I want to say there wasn't a week that went by in 15 years that I didn't have to deal with some type of shit that hit the fan. And, you know, you just gain, you just gain this level of toughness after, after that amount of time and things just start rolling off you. Yeah. What are your thoughts? You mentioned like the social media kind of side of things. What, what's your thoughts? Cause it's a relatively new thing, I guess, compared to the amount of time that you've been doing this. It probably wasn't there when you started. Yeah. How do you feel about the success of some of these people that have got millions and now giving a lot of fitness advice? Some of them, are, are, some of them deservedly, but some of them have, have actually got there because they've got a great body and, and yeah. now they're probably in a position to talk about it. You know, what? I, I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I know a lot of coaches actually hate on other people and, and they're like, oh, well, he's not a coach and he has 4 million followers and he doesn't know what he's doing. I was like, yeah, but you know, and if he's influencing someone to get off the couch and someone's motivated by this individual and they can incorporate some good habits or some good nutritional habits or some good recovery or lifestyle habits and it puts them into a better space, who am I to knock it, right? Um, but I also understand that most of the people who are knocking it are, are normally the ones that are bitter because they haven't found that level of success. Like I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who have like, have their degree in exercise science or exercise phys or their master's degree. And they're sitting there like, Oh, so-and-so is making this money. I'm like, dude, get off your ass, man. Like, like you put all this time in your education and I respect that. And I love the educational piece of it, but you need to step back and recognize what area you're actually not good at. And that area might be the marketing. That area might be, you know, putting yourself out there. That, that area might be like setting a business plan or hiring a team or doing these things that you need to do to become successful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hear criticism all the, all the, all the time. It, it's not really, if they're getting someone else off the couch, I'm fine with it. I'm not really so focused on what other people do. I'm, I'm more focused on what I do, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think at a certain point, people need to start assessing, you know, why is a thousand people in a room watching this individual? And what I mean by that is I speak at, I speak for a company called Perform Better every year. I've got a talk, a mastermind talk coming up in the beginning of December. And um, I'll never forget one of my first ones where I brought my team to and I was happened to be speaking at it. Um, one of my coaches on my team was like, I'm not going to listen to this guy. And I'm like, why not? Like, oh, he's a clown. And he started kind of knocking him, hating on him a little bit. And I said, yeah, well, that guy is like 700 people in the room. So, you know, probably has the most amount of people in that room, yet he's a clown. So we're all going to go sit and listen to him now. And I made my whole team go in and sit and listen to him. And I said, you know what? Say what you want. Maybe the education's not there as much, but there is a reason why this person just brought 700 people into a room. And that's what you have to learn. That's what you have to develop to become successful because you don't have it. And if you keep going down the route that you're going down right now, you'll never have it. And I think that's probably the area I see with not only young coaches, but young business people. They just can't step back and assess the areas that they're weak at. They're afraid to surround themselves with a team that can help them. Yeah, good, good point. So when you're, when you're about to work with clients, what is important for you from a preparation? Because I, I guess leading on from that previous conversation there's a lot of now they, there's with with the i suppose the uh, introduction of things like peloton there's a there's a whole number of ways that you can get fit that are very digital based and and you you know whatever 
level you're at, you jump into it. And I, I, I heard a comment, um, maybe an interview you did where, where you was referring to HIT training, mentioning that, you know, people really have to earn the right to do HIT training. So I was, I was just kind of curious about sort of, you know, how, how, what, what's the preparation that you go in terms of evaluating your clients? And what can people learn about when they maybe when they're jumping into a program about sort of making sure that maybe if, if they haven't got a coach that's doing that for them, how can they assess themselves about going into something that may or may not be right for them? Well, when I was when I owned my club and I was working with a lot of people one on one, uh, there was an evaluation process. So the first thing I'd always like to do is have a conversation with the person. And that conversation would come after they filled out like a health question year. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, health history, but I also want to get an understanding of like temperament, personality, like how do they, you know, are they moody? Are they, are they, are they upbeat? What do they feel has worked for them? What do they feel hasn't worked for them? And I think once I kind of get to the bottom of that, we can establish a little bit of a rapport. Then I think it would always go into some sort of a movement screening. Now, I had a team of physical therapists that work with me where as a coach, I would run people through an FMS. And if we saw any red flags, I'd include the physical therapist in there to then maybe put them through an, F an SFMA or um, another type of movement screening to where we really were able to assess, you know, what's going on in that human body. And then... It's figuring out a way to give them a little bit of what they want while I'm doing a lot of what I want. Right. And, and that, what do I mean by that? You know, you, you have to make sure that they're entertained. You have to make sure that they're enjoying what they're doing because that's part of it all. Like if someone's coming in and they're bored out of their mind and they're not clicking with the coach, that's not doing them good at, um, also. But it's my job to turn around and to make sure I'm delivering to them what I need to deliver to one, improve mobility, which is the combination of flexibility and stability. And it's all about mobility in my eyes. Like if you can get into a good heavy squat position, you've got good mobility, right? So it's, it's mobility is a term that I think is really um, underutilized. And, you know, based off of what their goals are, you know, figuring out a way to hit those triggers and, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, whether it's more strength increase or whether I'm getting Hellboy ready, uh, Dave Harbour ready for Hellboy. And, you know, our goal was to keep him around the same way, 250 pounds through the training. He just had to get crazy strong and we had to get him a bit leaner and we had to make sure his body was resilient. Then when Ryan's getting ready for a movie or Sebastian's getting ready for a movie, they got to take their shirts off and people need to be like, oh my God, different, right? It, it's different per individual. Great, great story. I always tell this is uh, Drew Powell. He played um, um, Solomon Grundy in the Gotham series and I, I never knew who Drew was and him and I get on a phone call and I'm, he's like, yeah, I, I want to, you know, I want to come in. I want to meet you. You know, I, I'd love to work with you. And I'm like, Drew, listen, my, my schedule's crazy, but my, but my team is fantastic and I'll oversee everything. So just come in and let's meet. And he comes in and I look at him and he's like built like a big farm boy football player. And I just look up at him and it like slipped. I was like, please don't say Brad hit fight club. And he just looked at me and got it. And we just started hysterically laughing. He goes, I think I know what you meant by that. I put my arms around him. I just gave him a hug. And I was like, listen, man, I'm like every single person who calls to get ready for movies either wants to look like Ryan in this or Brad Pitt Fight Club. And I just looked at you and I said, please don't say Brad Pitt Fight Club. And it became, he ended up becoming one of my closest friends of all time. I mean, our families are tight. And ever since then, we still tell that story and I love him to death. So it's interesting when people are getting ready for these movies, we have to, male or female, we have to get a general idea of what they're trying to look like. And in the back of my head, it's like, all right, we got to get them to look like this. But most importantly, it's resiliency and it's movement and it's energy. And if I can get those things in place to where every day they're waking up and they feel like a machine and they're recovering and we're doing this through proper nutrition and, you know, maybe some healthy supplementation and rest and recovery modalities and all this stuff, you know, my job is to get them through however many weeks or months they, they have to be shooting and turn around and not feeling like they got hit by a car. You mentioned the word resilience a few times. What, what does that mean to you and why should that probably be a general fitness goal that, that we should all be thinking about? I think it needs to be one of the main ones. Um, so resiliency to me is, is someone who can take, take, a, take a punch physically and mentally. It's, a, it's like golfers, for instance. I worked with many golfers in my career because our, our club started as a golf uh, fitness performance facility. My brother was a professional golfer. And my... Um, my goals in the beginning, I was I would lay out like these year long programs and periodize them and peak them at certain points. And then out of nowhere, you know, so and so is on the road and we get sick in Malaysia. And the next thing you know, our whole program was like upside down and that person's discouraged. And I just learned throughout the years that I didn't really care as much about 
whether they hit the golf ball five yards further or not, even though they all ended up doing that. I cared more about whether their bodies broke down or not. I wanted them to get through a full season and allow them to feel a certain way, a certain amount of energy where they can push. Um, and you hear this with a lot of athletes by the time they get to the end of the season, they're like so wiped and they have to shut down. And I understand that it's emotional, but my goal is physical and mental resiliency. How can we give them the tools to where they're on the road, they're keeping up with their nutrition, they're, fig they're understanding that sleep isn't some luxury, it's a necessity, it's something that we really need. It's none of these, that's why I can't stand these stories when in the Huffington Post, you're, you're hearing like Mike Wal Mark Wahlberg say, oh, I get up at 2.30 every morning. To, I'm like, okay, how long is that gonna work for, right? Like, and it's setting a bad example. So sleep is so important. So I like giving these individuals the tools to where um, they can be on the road on their own and they can make really smart decisions. Mm. With, uh, you mentioned nutrition, what, how, how involved do you get on that side of things? 100%. And, 100%. And 100%. Are there any, with, you know, with it being, I suppose it's like exercise really, there's so many different diets and um, there's, you know, fasting and low fat and high fat. Is, is there anything in terms of building resilience in terms of your nutrition that, that you find that regardless of, of the types of people that you're working with, you found that, that these are some basics that, that you should just, you know, get in place outside of everything else? Well, it's tough because, you know, you look at, you, well, first off, yes. And I kept, I kept interrupting you. I apologize a hundred percent, a hundred percent, because for me, um, the training part's the easy part because there's, I've created thousands of programs in my life and, you know, uh, they're all, they're all great and they all work and, you know, some better for certain people than, than others. But, you know, the first thing I'm always asking an individual is, is about sleep and digestion, right? Those are kind of the first. And right after that, I'm getting into nutrition. Nutrition is, I, I think, one of the most one of the most misunderstood areas. I think everyone wants to coin a specific diet. They want they want to name a specific diet. There's always some type of trick. There's always some type of immediate um, immediate uh, response that they're looking for out of you know doing a specific nutritional plan. Like now, I think something like the ketogenic diet. I think it's needed for certain individuals, right? But most people are doing it because of, of taking more of a yo-yo dieting approach because they're dehydrating the muscle of water. And, you know, that's showing them a, you know, a way to quantify their success by standing on a scale. I take a much different approach. I believe in high quality food, right? With like high quality nutrients, macro and micro. And I believe in metabolic flexibility. And for those people who don't understand what that is, we have two energy sources. We have our fats and we have our carbs. And I believe we should use them both. And in doing that, our metabolism has to become flexible in using those um, those uh, macronutrients at specific times during the day. It's why I joined a company that's called Lumen. It's been incredible. It's a, a little chamber that you breathe into, and it actually measures, you know, whether you uh, need to be more on a higher carb day and a higher fat day. Um, and I got information about that on my YouTube page that someone can go and, re and read about. It's very interesting. But at the end of the day, what Lumen is really promoting is metabolic flexibility. It's telling you that, nope, you need, you need carbs and you need fats. And anytime we just turn around and we rid our body of one of those nutrients, I find ourselves um, less able to be able to utilize those macronutrients when we consume them. And at some point, listen, if you're doing a ketogenic diet, if you're doing a low carb diet, at some point you're going to cave in, right? Like it's going to happen where you're just going to go eat that pizza or go eat those nachos. You're going to go out, you're going to have a few beers or whatever it is. And what happens at that point? And the reason why I love metabolic flexibility is because it's allowing ourselves to use those energy, those different energy sources, but it's also allowing our, our system to not take such a huge hit. For example, someone cuts carbohydrates for two weeks and they lose eight pounds and they're all excited. And then the holidays come around, Thanksgiving's next week, and they go and they eat a lot. They're sitting there the next day getting discouraged, going, oh, my God, I gained five of it back. I feel like when you are focusing on a flexible metabolism, uh, you can uh, your system's getting a little bit more resilient. And you're able to utilize those nutrients a little bit more in a positive way rather than it showing up on your system in a negative way. And I really think this all comes down to mindset and how you're approaching nutrition, which is a much longer con conversation. Mm. I was it, it, the carbs and the fats is an interesting one because it's, it's talked about a lot and some people fall into two very strong camp, camps and have good arguments about it and and I was going to ask you that question but I also read about lumen and I you know maybe for a moment I think this is an interesting thing to talk about because it, so so 
the, the, the Lumen product then, does that tell you what your body needs in terms of carbs and fats? Then? Is it, that what it, it, it does. It takes a few days for the system to actually learn you know, what's going on in your body. So I would never say if you were to buy one, start listening to the information out of the gate. I would take about a week. Um, but yeah, I've used it with bodybuilder friends of mine who unfortunately, uh, because of photo shoots were so high on the protein and so low on the fats and carbs because of, um, that they, that they had to stay lean, that they really ended up developing issues with their metabolism. You know, I have friends of mine that are 250, 260 pounds that are, you know, world-class competitors that, couldn't like I could on certain days I could consume six, 700 grams of carbohydrates, you know, healthier carbohydrates, but my, my body doesn't get fat. Like it doesn't, I actually use that um, to my advantage. My muscles might fill with a little bit more glycogen. I might get a little fuller. My energy level might go up a little bit. And that's why I feel like that I every day, even at 44 years old, like I'm still able to set PRs and lifting. I'm still able to run. I played hockey, ice hockey this morning at, at a game. My energy level's high. My movement's my movement quality is high. So I know once um, our nutrition starts falling, um, you know, to the side a little bit, energy starts diminishing our ability, our wanting, uh, our willingness to want to move and stretch and do all these things that we want to do really begins to diminish. I think part of the problem is, is that, you know, anytime someone hops on something new, they have this feeling of like success, right? Like, you know, you hear it all the, all the time. What was that? Um, what was that terrible movie? It was on, um, Oh, oh God, it was on, um, oh God, it was, it was, it was on, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> um, smashing plants here, but I, I love plant strong diets, but it was talking about, it was that new doc. It was a documentary the last few years that was basically bashing people who eat animal protein. Uh, yeah. Okay. James Cameron I, I was one of the, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm drawing a blank right now. I, I don't even know why, but, um, you know, I, I think there was a scene in, in the movie where you, they took a bunch of firefighters and they were like, oh, these firemen are eat, drinking beers and eating Doritos and eating fast food. And then they like go grocery shopping for them. Like, ooh, right? And it's like they show up with plants and grains and they're like, we're going to substitute like a bean patty instead of like the McDonald's hamburger you're eating. And within like a week, they all lost weight. Like, oh my God, like groundbreaking news. You just removed all this crap from their diet. And you added in all this beautiful stuff and they, they saw a response from it. Right. But what they, what, what the documentary didn't necessarily show was how many of these people from neglecting themselves on animal protein would actually be deprived of specific nutrients or how many athletes who went plant, a uh, plant based, you know, be, became either a vegan or a vegetarian ended up having to go back to eating animal protein because specific you know, blood markers on them plummeted or specific nutrients that they were once getting in their body, they weren't getting anymore. And this isn't to, to, to bash veganism or bash vegetarians, but it's just people will hear these stories and then they'll be like, oh, okay, I don't know any better. Like, let me give that a try where the information needs to be um, a little bit better. And I can't tell you, I mean, starting with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, um, research experts that will go on and say, no, that documentary was terrible. Like you're, you're not, but, but we're all, people are all battling, right? But anytime you start something new, um, it's going to feel good. You just have to ask yourself, is this a good long-term approach? What are your thoughts on fasting or, or intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting? Cause that's also I've, like, I've been trying the sort of 16, eight yep. um and the, you know I've, I've found it particularly as i've been traveling i found that's worked quite well for me not that i'm trying to lose weight but i, I kind of feel pretty good I'm, my sleep is is pretty decent i've stopped i've stopped eating quite as late and and started later um probably don't consume quite as much food in that window but the food i do consume is is sort of set meals so do, do you have a view on either fasting or time restricted eating yeah I, I i i'm i'm into it i mean i'm i'm actually running a um, um i run challenges every month and i know in january the a nutritionist i work with coach adam ross and i are creating a uh, a, a two-week elimination diet and in that we're going to throw in a few days of fasting early on um i'm fine with it i think where i don't like so let me go on record to say i i do like fasting but when i don't like it 
is when people are using that to rebound from a poor day's worth of eating, or they're going to, they're going to do intermittent fasting during the day. Cause they know they're going to go out and crush a few vodkas and have a few hamburgers at night. Like that's when I think, or like, what about trying to put muscle on? Like when you're fasting and you're not eating for 16 hours and you have an opportunity to get your nutrients in eight hours a day, like that's going to be difficult for you to get in the macronutrients you need to put on muscle. Um, I'm fine with it because I like what it does from a brain function standpoint. And I think a lot of people like yourself who live healthy lifestyles are going to keep the train on the tracks and they're going to make good decisions most of the time. And I think for a while it works, but I think what people start noticing down the road is maybe this decrease in energy, right? Or this decrease in muscle mass. And that's something I want to be careful with because as we're getting older, we need to maintain a level of muscle mass. And that's something that people are really afraid of. They're like, oh, we're getting older. We got to stop lifting weights. We need to focus more on flexibility. I'm like, well, not really. Like my grandmother died at 88. You know, she fell um, and she shattered her hip. And then she had to go through this whole, you know, long, you know, uh, you know, list of surgeries. And maybe if she had more muscle and more body armor, that would have protected us and protected her. People don't look at people look at muscle as something as like a vanity. Like it's like, oh, vanity. Like Don just wants to be big. Like, no, this is body armor. It really is. And no one wants to look at it that way. So when I have someone who's aging, which is everyone, <laughs> like I want to make sure they have enough body armor on their body to God forbid withstand a car accident or withstand a fall or, you know, I, but it, then it's my job to make sure that they are mobile and they can control that muscle. Right. It's like looking at golfers for years and years, you know, all these um, and, um, analysts, Johnny Miller, Oh, Tiger Woods is too big. I'm like, no, Tiger Woods isn't too big. Like Tiger Woods had a knee problem or a back problem because he probably swung a golf club 12 million times to one side of the body. And that caused asymmetries. And at that torquing, you know, at that level of torque that it was causing on his knee or on his back could have caused some overuse injuries. It's not the healthiest sport. Like, let's face it. God didn't create us to swing a golf club to one side of the body, you know, 12 million times and say, you're going to be healthy. Yeah, you're going to have a back problem. So, you know, having a little bit of that extra muscle on, I think is beneficial as long as it's, um, as long as it's functional. Mm. And what about, you mentioned about mental performance. Is there anything in terms of diet that you've found that kind of keeps the brain working outside of recovery, which I'd like to come on to as, as well, but you know, from a nutrition perspective, is there anything that kind of keeps you sharp and things to avoid and things to kind of maybe incorporate into your diet? Yeah, I think inflammation is the enemy. I think things like sugars, I mean, if they're not naturally occurring, I mean, even if they're naturally occurring, I think can be abused a bit. But I, I think once nutritionally, you start really honing things in, and you start reducing inflammation in the body, I think, you know, just I think swelling in the body, I think, you know, those, uh, those achy joints or specific things that are going on, and you're going to start to feel minimized. And I really believe it'll contribute to, uh, I really believe, I mean, it's a, it's a fact, brain clarity and brain function and waking up and having, you know, that, that crisp pinpoint focus rather than having a meal and feeling foggy. And listen, food is medicine. Like there's, there's no doubt. No one can ever argue that. Um, you know, I believe, you know, you heard that line, you hear that line when you're a kid, you are what you eat, right? You really are. It's like, if I turn around and I eat crappy and I'm, you know, and I'm overstepping or if I'm having a couple too many drinks, like I'm, my recovery diminishes and my, my body composition diminishes and my, my brain function and my energy level, it all diminishes. And then my sleep quality diminishes. And then it's just this vicious effect. And that's what I think people go through and they abuse too much. If you want to do it, do it once in a while. But, you know, as you live more of a cleaner lifestyle, you'll really start seeing what those effects play on your on your body. Mm. I want to move on to exercise now. We, we mentioned HIIT before, and I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of probably touch on that again. So with this being so popular, it's in gyms and there's standalone studios that do this. What What's your views on it and um and you know is it, is it something you think is is good for people to get involved in and um and and sort of you know if, if so what what place would it have in a you know in someone's sort of exercise work week of exercise yeah you know i i think there is a there is a place for it and i think it depends on the you know age and trick of the age and the training age of the individual right i i think taking someone who um you know, might live an incredibly stressful life, an incredibly stressful work schedule, and bring them into a higher intensity environment. Um, don't go to the well too much. Right? I think it's something where you know I like to uh, even break my cardio down to higher intensity cardio, medium intensity 
cardio and more of my slower steady state. And those are kind of the different like energy systems I like to uh, uh, dial in on when I'm um, when I'm doing cardiovascular training. I think there's I think it gets overdone. I think first off, most people aren't really doing head training, and I think it's it's really getting overdone where you know a lot of people just feel like they have to go kick the living crap out of themselves every day. And it's a much smarter decision if maybe you turn around on certain days and you kept your heart rate between 120 and 150 beats a minute and allowed a lot of the waste to, to come out of the body and allowed yourself to recover and you wasn't so taxing on your CNS and you know, you're still burning calories and burning fat, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think it's smart and, and certain people are doing it. There are coaches out there, um, giving him some props, Joel, Joel Jameson, you know, who one of the godfathers of, uh, of, um, you're creating his system around heart rate variability and you're looking at you know systems now like aura ring which i wear which will help judge and med ready uh, measure readiness these things are you know aura is incredible like it's getting so much better now where you'll wake up and you'll be able to assess sleep and you'll be able to really kind of look at all right is it in store for me to put my foot on the gas and hit it hard or do i need to back off a little bit and i think that's um, these are these are tools as, as the technology is getting better um, it's going to allow us to be more successful. But to answer your question, I, I think people are overdoing the concept of having to go in and take this Rocky type mentality. Hmm. And you mentioned their cardio and some of the people that we speak to kind of cardio's become a little bit of a no, don't do cardio strength training. That's really what you want to be focusing on. Um, so I wanted to ask you about this. One is is your views on cardio and then and then to build on that sort of what what what's your preference steady state or intervals and also would you do this before or after strength training and, and there's a few things to talk about all there, right but. so the first question was cardio i don't think cardio is a useless piece i still think it's something that we need but i'm going to steal this line from my good friend ben bruno who said resistance training should be the entree cardio should be the side dish and that i believe in and when you see people in gyms and they're just spinning their wheels and they're on the elliptical my question to them is, well, how's that working for you, right? Are you are you at your goals? Now, if someone turns around to me and they're like, you know what? My blood work is perfect. I feel amazing. My body composition is great. I'm right where I want to be. Everything's spot on. Then who am I to tell them that they're doing something wrong, right? I mean, what is, what is the way that we quantify success here? But, you know, I still enjoy, you know, going in, doing some interval work, or I still enjoy going for a steady state run. I won't build the basis of my training around it. And I believe that most people overdo it and they end up, you know, putting their body in the stress state and they end up, you know, not building muscle the way they need to. And, you know, I can't tell you how many people I, I talk to that just don't get in any better shape. Um, and I just think they're taking the wrong approach. So, yeah, I think there's some value. I think turning around saying cardio is useless is, is you know, that's, that's, that's nonsense. And it's ridiculous because I think it depends on the goals. If you're looking at a, professional athlete if you're looking at a hockey player or a soccer player like cardio is a big component of what it is they do so they better make sure they have good cardiovascular health i think for heart health it's important i think for recovery it can be important i think to train different energy systems and be well-rounded and balanced it's important for me personally i will balance out between higher intensity work with medium intensity work which might be like your 30 on 30 off one minute one minute off with your slower steady state work. It might be me getting on the stairs, it might be me going for a run for 30 minutes, maintaining a certain heart rate. Um, and I think by mixing in those three forms of cardio, you stay well-rounded and um, you're not really dealing with any overuse, um, uh, what's what, over usages? I mean, how would you really uh, yeah. overuse injuries? I mean, you're, you're, you're not really putting yourself in jeopardy of like, you know, the constant pounding or I think the variability helps out in the, um, and the, um, uh, and the potential of, I don't like using the terminology overtraining, but let's just say overdoing it uh, starts mm -hmm. to minimize if you stay well rounded. And I, so, so I, I use, this is more of a selfish question, but I, I tend to start with a bit of a, a run, whether, like you say, interviews or steady state. Um, I prefer to do it outdoors. And that tends to kind of, as I'm, as I'm older now, it tends to help me for when I'm doing my strength training. One mentally it sort of gets me into it, it gets, breaks me into a bit of a sweat. Yep. But you're saying it's better to, if you can, to do strength first and cardio after. I'm not saying that necessarily, just because of what your answer was. Now, I got to look at your goals and say, you know, you're not a power lifter. Like, what are your goals? Your, your goals are you want to be, and I haven't even asked you, but I would assume you want to look better naked. You want really high levels of general health. You want high levels of energy. You want high levels of mobility. 
So if someone's going to turn around and maybe do a mile run, you know, before their resistance training session, I'm not going to tell them no. I'm like, all right, go for your mile run or your two mile run or whatever it is. It's a shorter distance. Now, if someone's going to turn around. They're going to say, oh, I'm going to go run 12 miles. I'm like, all right, listen, just be prepared that it's going to eat into, you know, your focus with your strength training. And it really seems like now you're, you're putting the main focus into cardio, which depending on what your goal is, might be what it needs to, uh, it, it might be what the goal should, should be. So mm. I would ask you, how much cardio are you, are you doing before you're lifting? I'll do about 20, 20 minutes ish. Yeah. Right, right about 20 minutes. I don't, too. I don't really see a problem with, with that. I mean, I, I don't think it's a big deal as long as you're feeling great for your session. And if you're progressing, that's fine. Um, what I normally like to do before a session is I like to allow someone to practice and they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, based off of my movement screening, I'm going to look at the areas of the body that you just, you know, things that aren't working well for you. Maybe it's your thoracic extension. Maybe it's your thoracic rotation. Maybe it's your hip mobility. Maybe it's your pull-up. Maybe your pull-ups just mm-hmm. weak. And I'll start mixing in things into their practice that's going to enable them to get better at those movement mm-hmm. qualities. And I'll spend, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes foam rolling. And then I might spend another five to 10 minutes, maybe more like 10 minutes on movement. By then, my, my 20 minutes is put into helping to improve those movement qualities, which I feel like in the longer run is giving them a lot more benefit. Now, mm. I, would, I would urge you maybe try taking that approach a little bit and seeing if your heart rate gets up and if it warms you up to now be able to get into your, to your strength training to where you're like, oh my God, my, my body feels amazing. Oh my God, I'm getting out of bed now and like my hips feel better. And then, you know, maybe separating the cardio to uh, to another time. But I just think mobility is so important. But for me to tell you, like, if you went and did that, I'm like, it's just not the same, Don. Then I'm going to say, all right, continue to do your 20 minutes of cardio, get your lift in. But let's try and find another time during the day where you can get that movement in. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I, me and most people, it, the, the, the run, the mobility stuff is something I know I should do and more of. And, and I am you know exactly what you said certainly stiff in certain areas and the cardio is probably more of a lazy way to just get that feeling as you're okay, doing I am it though. <laughs> you know what you're you are you are doing the work and that's why i'm saying like for years you know people like you mentioned peloton before they're like what do you think of peloton i'm like well, if it gets you off the couch great and if someone's like well what do you really think about peloton and i'm like you know what if i if i had my decision i wouldn't be telling people to sit while they're doing their cardio Like, look at you and I right now. We're sitting enough. It's been an hour. Like, we don't Mm. need to sit and do our cardio. But if someone's never been able to get off the couch and they're becoming motivated by one of their instructors and it's enabling them to move and sweat, then then do it. We don't always have to do what's best, right? Like, we just have to, at the end of the day, what's the goal? Like, you know, you want to get, I want to get into my 90s and I want to feel good, right? I want to be able to do pull-ups and be able to do all these things that I was able to do. And I want a high level of energy. So, we got to do things a little bit unconventionally and we to, to, to stay intrigued and enjoy, enjoy it as long as we're getting ourselves in a better shape and not putting ourselves in the worst shape than we'll then you're on. So I've, I've um, in terms of exercises, I've, I've seen you <clears throat> and heard you talk quite a bit about carries. And, and I wondered if there's any sort of uncommon or probably untraditional moves that, that uh, you feel are, are really important, sort of give you a great bang for buck exercises that maybe people wouldn't naturally, um, I, I guess, gravitate to? I don't think unconventional. I mean, I, I think with my with my programming, you know, I put a lot into the warm-up or practice. And then I think the lifting portion of it, I like to really balance out a good amount of uh, bilateral work, meaning off of two feet or two arms with unilateral work, which would be, you know, one leg, one arm. And allowing, you know, the body to open up and work on that balance and stability, I think is really important. But I almost kind of shy away from, you know, especially, you know, you see the coaches who are putting all these weird, sexy stuff um, on, on online. I mean, that's kind of an indicator that, like, it doesn't always have to look fresh and new and different. Like, it's sometimes it's just, you know, instilling and kind of driving home those, those good quality movements that most people aren't doing. And in terms of gym design, like I can see you've got a beautiful space behind you. Are there any favorite tools or essential things that when you're doing your own gym or if you were to do another one that you would you would make sure that are always in there? I just built this place. I mean, uh, I mean, it's literally kind of giving everyone a little taste. So I've got I'm on two floors here. So it's called the barn and the lights are down, but it's about 2000 square feet. It's on two floors. 
get a little bit of bright light here. But I mean, I've got dumbbells up to 150. I got kettlebells up to 48 kg. And then um, as for equipment, I literally have a nine foot pulley station. I've got a borderless treadmill, step, step mill, um, a lot of space behind me, as you guys can see, med ball areas, and then bringing you downstairs. Most people are a little shocked to see this. I'm going to turn on the light right now, giving you the full gym tour here in the background. Oh, nice. This, this is my home gym. So uh, power rack, all different specialty bars. Uh, we got everything, plate loaded stuff. Everything's by Life Fitness and Haver Strength. I got a nice little shower, locker room area. So I could, I can invite 30 people in right now and they can train comfortably. And, um, you know, so I just built this place. So to answer your question, yeah, pretty much everything from life, fitness and have strength. I love perform better. I love, and, um, that's it. Well, we'll have to get you some escape in there, Don. (laughs) So in terms of recovery, then as we sort of wrap up, I know it's something you're very passionate about. So are there any, um, any lessons or habits that you have used yourself or you encourage others to, to make sure that you've got that in the right balance in your sort of day or week or month? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I use things like um, cold plunges and cold showers and infrared saunas. You know, I have um, an infrared sauna at my house. I got a five minute infrared sauna showing up very soon. And, um, you know, massage guns, Norma Tech boots, massages. But like at the end of the at the end of the day, it's like sleep is free, and it's one of those things that you just need to be focusing on. And you could do all the modalities in the world, and if your sleep's not on point, you're not doing what you need to be doing. Um, it's going to be pretty tough to kind of play catch up. So uh, I would recommend just get an aura ring, uh, start monitoring your sleep, start looking at ways to change your behaviors. Maybe there's Maybe you are, like you said, eating too late at night and that's affecting your sleep quality. Maybe you think your sleep's good and it's not. Um, that's kind of where I would start and that's um, I would build from there. Yeah, I've, I've got one myself and I find it quite scary sometimes. I, I, I always think, I wish I didn't know that, but I've been hooked for a year and I'm, I'm going to get my sort of new version, which I believe sort of come, coming out the shortly. The Jet 3 is great. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I have it. Um, you know, I, I absolutely love it. So it, have, is there any, in terms of supplementation and sleep, have you, do you recommend anything or do you say, you know, do you, do you say, look, you know, don't take anything because it will make it even worse? Like there's a I few think things. The one thing, the one thing I'm okay with is some mag, magnesium and I use, um, I use it from a company called Thorn. Uh, I give a 15% off code on, on my site, donsaldino.com, but um, I like Thorn. I don't believe in any real sleep aids. I really believe in, you know, again, changing behavior and understanding how your nutrition is contributing to your sleep and how, you know, the, the light that you're in front of, you know, 15 minutes before is affecting your sleep. And there's so many quick changes that you can make that will uh, possibly affect um, an improvement in sleep, in sleep quality. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick that link down there. And I, I, I watched a video where you did some, it's a very interesting video and it broke, it broke down a lot of different supplements, including the ones that you take, which I'll also put as a link because I, I, I found that really useful. But are there any any things that you would say, because there's a, there's a, there is a lot of different supplements out there that people could take. Are, are there any of your sort of like, you know, one or two essential ones which you would suggest people consider as it relates to general health, well-being, and, and maintaining that muscle mass? You know what I like, I mean, muscle mass is something a little bit different, but you know, I like, you know, making sure that we're consuming things like a multivitamin, fish oil, vitamin D. I think those are like kind of my standard three that I'll pretty much take all year long. Things like BCAs and creatine, I, I think it's all fine, but um, they're not essential. Like the, we don't, we don't, you know, need to be taking those in supplements. Like we're going to survive with, without it. That's what I mean by essential. But um, I, I think the multi, the vitamin D and the fish oil, I think are all great. And uh, just make sure you're knocking down, nailing down your nutrition. And in terms of protein, is that something that you, you recommend you substitute with, with, a, with a supplement or would you recommend getting that through your foods? Um, no, I think supplements are for convenience. So I'm not going to turn around and say that a, but supplements are getting great now. Again, Thorne, I have it on my, on my site, but um, I feel like you can do it through regular nutrition and you don't have to spend on supplements, but again, supplements are supplements. They are there to kind of make things more convenient for you. And I can't tell you how often it comes in handy for me. 
So one more question, but just before that, Don, um, if people want to find out any more about, you've got a bunch of great online programs and information, where can people go to to follow some of the stuff about workouts, training, and everything that you're doing? Thank you very much. Um, Don Saladino on Instagram, or just go to donsaladino.com. You have joined my newsletter, my, my YouTube page, Don Saladino. That content's all free, so you can just join my YouTube and I update that probably weekly and um, not probably, I update it weekly. But yeah, I'm always giving out free content and I'm always um, answering questions. So, uh, you know, we'd love, to, we'd love to speak at some point. Fantastic. So last question then, Don. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be a memorable example of where you've escaped your own personal limits? Wow, escape my own personal limits. I think we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. Probably my probably work and and a lot of the frustrations I had to deal with, with things that I wasn't. Uh, I was always trying to control things early on, and I realized that certain things were just out of my control. So I think just taking a deep breath and understanding that you know you can't control everything, and learning to kind of grow up and mature and deal with those situations better, I think was an invaluable lesson for me. Fantastic. Well, Don, thanks very much for your time. It's been very useful personally. Um, Thank I'm you. sure it's been a lot of value to people who've been listening. And um, yeah, I hope to, hope to catch up with you in your gym in uh, New York at some point. We'd love to have you by. If you're ever in Long Island, hit me up and uh, let me know when this, uh, when this goes live and I'll put it up on my stories. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.